Okay, so now we're on chapter 28, uh, which is direct sensing, which is um, the ability of electronic components to sense changes in the physical world, and in particular 28.1 sensing devices. So in this video we're going to look at uh, four, four uh, um, devices which can um, register changes in the physical environment and transform them into um, kind of a way that an electronic circuit can understand. So as with um, any sensing system, sensing devices can be anything um, which are able to sense a variety of things. For example, um, a light, something which can sense the intensity of light is a sensor. Something, uh, a, um, a microphone, uh, a microphone here, a microphone, um, a microphone is also a sensor. Um, let me think, because it senses sound, changes in sound waves. Uh, for mom digital thermometers are an electronic sensor as well. Um, those thermometers, which are just a screen which can read you off the temperature, that's one. Um, basically, any electronic device which is able to um, tell you a change in the physical world in an electronic way is a digital sensor. And um, they normally work like this. We have what we call a sensing device, which is a device which changes its properties depending on um, a changes environment in the most fundamental way. So a change in light intensity might change the resistance of a component. And then this goes on to being a processing unit, which kind of converts this physical change into a one that we can kind of understand. And then this is given out as an output, which is the useful information that we can interpret it. So as an example, um, the, the light in a room might get brighter. The light getting brighter will decrease the resistance of this unit. So the resistance maybe might drop down to... Um, say 10 ohms. So this, um, this processing unit sees, hey, the resistance is now 10 ohms. That means um, the, temp uh, the light is now, uh, say, 20, lum uh, 20 lux. And that means we can come out here and output will say, hey, we have a light intensity of 20 lux here and on a screen. So that's how all sensing devices kind of work in the fundamental way. But what we need to do is we need to look at specific sensing devices and how they work. And we're going to look at four today. So let's start with the first one, which is the light-dependent resistor. So I have a picture of it here for you. Um, basically, a light-dependent resistor is this. Here we go, a light-dependent resistor. What it is is it's two metal grids, um, and in between there's a, a semiconducting material, and the material is something... An example of a material that could be used is calcium sulfide, and um, doped with copper, with copper. Um, but anyway, all right, with copper. But um, anyway, how this, how this works is basically, as you know, with um, semiconductors or anything metallic really, electrons are able to freely move around, but then there's some impedance of an electron's movement because of, you know, resistance. But when light comes along and hits this, what it does is it lets, uh, it lets the electrons move more freely, it kind of liberates them, and they are more easily able to move around. So, in essence, when the light intensity increases, the resistance decreases. And that's all a light-dependent resistor is. It's a metal grid with semiconducting materials in between. And um, as light goes in, it makes um, it more easily more easy to move through the semiconducting material. Essentially, the resistance of this component decreases. So, um, here we go. Um, the graph normally looks something like this. Like that. And on the, this axis, we'll put resistance. And on this axis, we'll put um, light intensity. And that's what it is. So it's, it's not direct, and you see this one has, needs to be calibrated for a calibration curve because you need to say, okay, this resistance means it's this um, light intensity, this one here means it's that. But um, you can see how, f by measuring resistance of this, we can easily see how strong the light is outside. So that's one example of um, a light, uh, of a sensing device. Um, let's, let's look at the second one. The second one here is called a... Um, a thermosistor, and you might be familiar with thermosistors already. Basically, um, it's uh, y you might know with most metals we have this kind of trend here, where so when you increase the temperature of a metal, the resistance of it also increases. A thermosistor is a kind of metal which o um, operates the opposite trend. So when the temperature increases, the resistance of it actually decreases. So um, I'm going to keep a tally here so you can remember what it is, how they are. So with an LDR, oh, with an LDR. As light intensity increases, resistance decreases, and this is the same one here. So um, this is just a metals which represent the opposite trend. But mostly, um, most of the time they would be metal oxides, and these are very good because they have a wide range. Because metals, they basically can operate until um, the melting point of metal. Whereas a normal thermometer only has a zero to one hundred degree kind of range, or sort of, for mercury, because that's the only place it's linear. 
This one here can operate in huge ranges. You cannot have until the metal mounts. And again, this is a non-linear relationship. It looks something like this. It looks actually exactly the same as the light one. Um, there's a resistance here, there's temperature here, and it's a uh, uh, curve like that. So again, you need to calibrate this, but uh, so this is another one as resistance changes. So let's write that in. So the next one we have is a thermosistor. Thermosistor. Um, and in this one, as the temperature increases, resistance decreases. It's the same trend as the LDR, the light dependent um, resistor. So um, moving on, uh, let's take a look at the next one. The next one we're looking at is something called a piezoelectric transducer. The word transducer just means that um, some, anything which can change one type of energy to another type of energy. So this one is something that doesn't use the change of um, resistance. This is what a piezoelectric uh, transducer looks like. Familiar? This is actually a microphone. Basically, transducers change, as I said, one type of energy to another. So a piezoelectric it uses a ability effect that um, it changes sound waves into a uh, voltage. So um, um, this is basically I'll go and this is I'll go into this in more detail um, in a further video um, when we look at sound waves um, and the applications of them in sonar and um, ultrasound. And, but basically. Uh, because of the crystal lattice of this um, piezoelectric crystal, you get something called a piezoelectric effect. Whereas when you compress and expand these crystals, they can they create a um, potential difference, and this works both ways. If you apply a potential difference, they create um, uh, it, it creates expansion and contraction. So this can be used to both produce sound, or uh, this can be used if you apply voltage, it can produce sound, and if you apply sound, it can produce voltage. So these are why it's called a transducer. It can go both ways. And it, um, this changes the what you would call the um, longitudinal waves. If you can't remember what longitudinal wave looks like, I have an image of it here, and it looks like this. Um, it's like, the best way to visualize this is as a slingy. So um, at a certain point of compression and extension, and that's the same thing. When a sound wave hits this, it compresses and extends the crystals in it, which uh, which kind of because of a um, uneven distribution of charge, which I'll go into later, um, it creates a voltage. Basically, the, uh, the premise is sound waves make voltage. And this is microphones and speakers. A microphone would be the sensing component. Uh, speakers would be the output component. So let's um, let's make a note of that. So um, in the piezoelectric transducer, um, sound up, more sound equals um, greater voltage into a higher voltage. And the last one we need to look at is something called a metal strain gauge. And this is probably the most intuitive one that you're probably quite familiar with. Looks like this. It's very, very simple. So sometimes engineers need to look at, um, look for physical deformation of a, a, a electronic component. For example, um, if say a bridge is getting too, uh, too extent, as, if a bridge, uh, sorry that's a bad example. If a uh, if a rope is getting too far extended, it's being pulled and stretched too far, that it's unsafe, this might send a voltage off or to set alarms to say, hey, we need to stop using this, we need to replace it, fix it. So um, we need to sometimes, this measures physical um, compression and elevation, um, compression and extension. Basically, it's a whole lot of wires like this, and we, we kind of make them into a mesh shape to fit more wires so that the changes can be more easily detected. Basically, this is it's very simply extended along with whatever you're dealing with. So, as you know, um, we have this thing here where resistivity is proportional to um, length over area. Uh, that, and if we just assume the area is the same, as this gets stretched, the length increases, and that means resistance increases. The actual formula is um, rho for resistivity constant length over area. But anyway, we assume the area of this wire remains the same because it changes negligibly. And then the length increases, which means the resistance of this entire thing will increase in a proportional way with um, the light. So um, let's write that down. So this is our metal wire strain, strain gauge. Wire. Strain. Um, but basically it is, in essence, just a metal wire. Um, so as the La, um, sorry, the length increases, uh, you get a proportional increase in resistance. Okay, so it's all good and well saying that these components can change your resistance within a circuit depending on the physical environment. But now how do we trans tra change these um, changes in resistance into something we can kind of tangibly compute? 
Well, this is where there's something called a... Um, there's two ways, principally, that you need to know. Um, one's called the op-amp, which we'll cover in the next video. And the other one's called the potential divider, which you're hopefully already familiar with. And I'm going to go over briefly now. So a potential divider circuit looks like this. Let me go ahead and draw this. As you can see, three out of these four need um, give resistance. And it's far easier to sense a change in voltage rather than a change in resistance. So there we go. So um, let's say we have a battery, which would be our power supply. Um, here's a battery. And then um, the battery goes in and we have a resistor here. And then over here, um, we have our variable component, so I'll call this VC. This might be the LDA, the thermal system, the middle, strain gauge, anything. So this is where the um, strain, um, strain, sorry, the variable component goes. And then it goes and connects back to the battery. And then over here we have something called the V out. We put a wires across here. And this is a voltage out. This is voltage which goes to whatever component we want it to go to. So V out. Okay, so um, this is V in. Okay, so um, we have a formula here which we know a potential divider, remember, electrons go along here, and in the circuit they must deposit a proportion of the energy in this resistor, and a proportion of the energy in this resistor. And they, um, remember, V equals IR, so um, because the current in both of these has to be the same, um, basically, um, the voltage that goes through them is proportional to the, um, the voltage that goes through them is in the ratio of the resistances. So, um, the, if you remember, the for V out over V in, so the voltage which is expended on this one is equal to um, the resistance of a variable um, component over the resistance of a normal component plus the resistance of a variable component. So um, if you can imagine this, if this gets more resistance, the voltage in this circuit would, uh, voltage going out, which is the voltage um, around uh, passing through this, this component here, would if a resistance increases, the voltage uh, would increase as well, because it gets a larger proportion of this V in. So this might be a 9-volt battery. If this is a high resistance, that means you're essentially expending uh, maybe like 8 volts over here and 1 volt here. But when the resistance decreases, you'll be expending 6 volts here and only 3 volts here. And so basically, and this, you, can be, you can sense how much voltage is um, uh, expended here through um, a, uh, through just you, uh, having a V out here, which is um, if you attached a voltmeter here, you'd be able to see what the difference between these two parts is. And that's how sensing devices translate this change in resistance into a, a tangible change in voltage. And that's useful for us and it lets us kind of understand how this works. So that's all I have for this video and I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video.